Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of W102. So a few announcements. This is the Wednesday lecture. There was no Monday lecture for last week because it was for this week because it was Memorial Day. You have homework seven due on Friday, May 29th, this coming Friday. Uh, as we have done previously, you get 1% extra credit if you turn it in by Friday. Otherwise, you get a no questions asked extension up until Sunday. Another announcement is that you have exam number two, or if you want to call it the final exam. It's really an exam number two and not really a final in the sense that everything will be the same. Uh, it'll be given on June 3rd. It will be 24 hour take home as before. Same honor code applies. Uh, on the Monday, June 1st, there will be two lectures released. There'll be a lecture 17, which will be not on final, except for bonus question. And there will also be a review, like kind of like a final exam review, exactly like we did for the first exam. So a cliff notes, where I sort of go over some concepts that you may want to review. If you have any questions on the exam, please feel free to come to my office hours. And I'll send out any other further details on the timing via email. Please do feel free, if anything is unclear, to either email me directly or just simply post to the Piazza. All right. Cool, we have a pretty exciting lecture today, so I won't bore you with any administrative details. All right, also in lecture 17, uh, grading. We won't discuss grading in this lecture, so we can keep it technical, but in lecture 17, uh, I'll touch a bit on the grading philosophy. Awesome. So last time we discussed sampling. In general, we can't really store a continuous time signal, uh, but what we can do is we can sample it at these discrete times here. And what we kind of saw was that if we sample the signal, there's this critical sampling rate called a Nyquist rate, uh, such that if we sample at this rate, if we take sufficiently many samples, that uh, at least the samples are spaced close enough apart, then we can apply this thing called sync interpolation or uh, Whitaker-Shannon interpolation formula, which is basically like saying we take a sink, scale it to the height of the sample, and then add it at every sample location. And that's an example here where you're doing shift and add of the green curves, which are sinks, and you're adding them up to make that continuous signal in red. What's very special about this, it's hard to really convey this uh, over video chat, but this is really, really special. What it's telling you is that you can go from a discrete signal to a continuous signal with mathematical exactness. Uh, that's really amazing because a discrete signal might have like a thousand points, but the continuous mathematical signal will have infinity points. So somehow you're recovering perfectly that mathematical signal subject to the condition, subject to the condition that you have a uh, band limited signal. The signal in the frequency domain is band limited. So the signal in particular is band limited such that you have essentially 2 pi b and minus 2 pi b uh, in, in the frequency domain as your bandwidth. Now, ideally, what you want to do is you want to be able to sample. When you sample a digital signal, you end up with copies or replicas in the frequency domain, and you don't want these replicas to overlap. So in this particular case, this blue signal here is one replica, right? This is the triangle, so you should be able to know what it's uh, this is a triangle of frequency, so you should know what it is in the time domain, if you review from last lecture. But you've got a triangle here, and you've got another triangle here, but unfortunately they overlap. So over here, you're actually going to add it, and you're going to get kind of a different signal. You're going to end up getting, effectively, this alias copy here, and you'll be taking the inverse Fourier transform of this, which is not the same as the inverse Fourier transform of a triangle. So this is a problem. This is bad. This is called aliasing. 
So last time we discussed this form of aliasing, it's a leftover slide. And this is a view of aliasing in the frequency domain. And this is kind of intuitively how it looks in frequency domain, but we can also study aliasing in the time domain. Uh, we can't study it in the time domain for all signals, but we can specifically look at aliasing for a sinusoidal signal. So here's a concrete example. Here I have two sine waves that are just plotted uh, on a plot. So this axis is time. So I have two sine waves, two friendly sine waves in the time domain. Uh, one sine wave is at a frequency of 0.75 hertz. So I have a sine wave here. I'll draw that in green. Oops, it's a little thick. I have a sine wave here and it continues. And this sine wave uh, might be at 0.75 hertz. So I have sine of 2 pi times 0 0.75 times t. All right, so I have the sine wave and I can sample it. Uh, I can sample it at 2 hertz. So I'm going to sample it every half second. And that's what these red samples mean. These are the, the samples I capture. Now I'm going to erase that curve. And if you just look at the red samples here, this is sampled. Uh, sampled at 2 hertz or 0 0.5 seconds between samples. Now if I look at these samples, I am sampling at an effective frequency of 2 hertz and uh, what I'm actually succumbing to is aliasing if the frequency was higher. So for example, uh, if, it's, if I'm sampling at 2 hertz, this is totally fine if the signal is uh, 0.75 hertz, right? If I'm sampling at 2 hertz, the Nyquist rate for this green signal here is twice the frequency. So in order to meet the Nyquist rate, I need to sample at at least 1.5 hertz, which I'm doing here because I'm sampling at 2 hertz. So this is perfectly good to exactly recover a 0.75 hertz sine wave. So this is really good. This is super Nyquist because I'm sampling above the Nyquist rate, so it's even better. So super Nyquist. If my highest frequency was 0 0.5 hertz. Right, or really I could go up to one hertz, uh, given that the Nyquist rate is twice the maximum frequency. Now, in this bottom curve here, I'm gonna say, you know what? Orchestra changes its tune. It takes the pitch and it increases it from 0.75 hertz to 1.25 hertz. So now this red signal, red means bad, so let's draw it in red. So this red signal now is at a higher frequency. And this higher frequency is at 1.25 hertz. All right, so I have this 1.25 hertz signal. Now, the Nyquist rate for this should have been uh, 2.5 hertz. But I have not sampled at the Nyquist rate. And that's going to cause aliasing. Well, what is aliasing? Aliasing is when a high frequency signal can masquerade as a lower frequency signal. Okay. So uh, high frequencies of one copy would alias as low frequency. So they're kind of masquerading. So in this particular case, this high frequency here at 1.25 Hertz is pretending to be 0.75 Hertz in the digital domain. Why? Because if I look at these samples, look at these samples right here, right here, right here, right here, here, zero crossing. In the digital domain, if I were to remove the outline of these curves, the stem plots are exactly the same whether the sine wave was 1.25 hertz or whether the sine wave was 0.75 hertz. These are exactly the same in the time domain. And so this is an illustration of exactly what's happening in this regime where you have aliasing. All right, uh, there are a lot of other examples of aliasing in everyday life, and I'm happy to talk about them in office hours. Uh, one of them is 
this is kind of nerdy, but uh, I really like basketball. I watch uh, a lot of basketball too much. And um, one of my favorite coaches is Steve Kerr, who, who coaches the Golden State Warriors. And he ends up wearing these dress shirts in every press interview after the game is finished. And these dress shirts have like this really checked pattern, he, like, uh, uh, like checkers. And uh, the checkers are like a frequency. If you think about them as a square wave, they're a really high frequency. And if the frequency is too high, the camera actually aliases. So you see a very weird pattern where these high frequency checkers actually end up looking like low frequency checkers. So just like this high frequency checker here, we were here, right? This is a high frequency signal. It's going to masquerade as a 0.75 hertz sine wave. Same way, his high frequency check shirt sort of masquerades as a lower frequency pattern. And there's some randomness to it. And so they call this a moray pattern. So if you want to do some further Googling, you can Google like moray pattern, or you could just take a look at Steve Kerr press conference and look at one of the shirts that's high frequency, and you'll kind of see this rippling uh, on his chest. OK. So that's aliasing. It exists. How do we solve aliasing? Well. There's no real way to solve aliasing. It's a mathematical fact and phenomena. So if you sample below the Nyquist rate, you will have aliasing. So one way to solve aliasing is don't sample below the Nyquist rate. You know, take more samples. But that could be expensive. You're taking more samples. You're storing more digital data. You have a faster uh, you know, uh, acquisition scheme. And your hardware may not support that. So. What's another way to ameliorate aliasing? Well, one way to do that is to kill the high frequencies. So one way is you take your signal that's coming in. Let's say that my signal, let's put concrete examples. Let's say that uh, I have an orchestra, and the orchestra is it's a really low frequency orchestra. Orchestra, They're playing 0.75 hertz. So this is not geared towards humans, because humans hear from 20 to 20,000 hertz, but it's for some alien species that hears uh, you know, music in this in this frequency range. Now, all of a sudden, there's uh, there's music, and you have these these nice signals all the way from zero to zero point seven five hertz, and that's music for this alien species. Now, unfortunately, um, there's an interference in the power line. Maybe there's an there's some sort of interference that's happening, and you have this non musical frequency that comes in at one point two five hertz as we spoke about before. And that 1.25 hertz is problematic because it's gonna go into my alien orchestra and it's gonna exactly try, you know, be digitally represented the same way as a 0.75 hertz if my sampling frequency, you know, is the same, which was two hertz, right? We used the two hertz sampling frequency on the last slide. And if I do that, this 1.25 hertz interference that's within F of T, is going to masquerade as 0.75 hertz. And this is not good. So what can we do? Well, uh, as soon as we capture f of t, before we go and digitize it while it's still in the analog domain, we can somehow figure out a way to kill this. Okay, we can somehow kill the 1.25 hertz uh, using some filtering. So here, this is a filter that will make that operation happen. Um, it could be a mechanical filter that you know, you have a piece of metal that stops oscillating if, uh, if the frequency of a wave is more than 0.75 hertz. So it could be some mechanical engineering to somehow remove high frequency signals. It could be an RC circuit, for example, a low pass filter, uh, a resistor and a capacitor circuit. And all of this is gonna happen before you digitize. And then you're gonna do your digitization after you have cleaned up the signal to remove high frequency components. Uh, this is kind of uh, what we do in standard practice called anti-aliasing filters. You may have heard them. Uh, if you play video games, it's one of the settings, like to improve the graphics or play, you know, play movies, it's, it's like an anti-aliasing filter. So that's exactly what it's doing. It's removing the high frequencies. Um, so in this particular case, um, what's, uh, what it's effectively doing is if we go back to the Golden State Warriors example of Steve Kerr, uh, it's like uh, this anti-aliasing filter analogy would be like telling Steve Kerr, hey, Steve, you cannot wear uh, 
a high frequency shirt, I'm going to give you this plain shirt to wear. It's a plain solid color blue shirt. This is like a human version of an anti-aliasing filter where you give specific instructions or constraints on f of t. Uh, the other analogy is your ear. Your ear is also a low pass filter because it'll only pass uh, sound up to 20,000 hertz through. And because of this, we don't need to digitize. Our Nyquist rate only needs to be up to 40,000 hertz. So if you have further questions on this, please come to office hours for further questions on anti-aliasing filters. OK. So one thing to keep in mind is anti-aliasing filters are also not perfect. We don't have this perfect filter, which is exactly going to go and kill the 1.25 hertz uh, sine wave. Usually with mechanical engineering or electrical engineering circuits, like an RC circuit, we can attenuate it greatly, but we cannot completely kill it. So we're going to have these slight artifacts, but that's a lot better which is why the slide of the title is ameliorating aliasing, not eliminating it. OK, so now we have covered sampling. And we're going to move to the last segment of the class, um, which is Laplace transforms. I'll give you a brief primer on Laplace transforms before we actually go into the specifics. Uh, we, we remember the story about uh, Fourier, right? He um, he goes to the uh, French school of math, and one of his examiners is Laplace. And the story is that, uh, uh, you know, that, that's quite an exam, right? To go to an exam and have one of your examiners be Laplace. And uh, when Fourier came up with this Fourier transform, it was actually going a little bit against the philosophy of Laplace, as we'll kind of see in this lecture. Now, as of today, in the modern era, uh, the Fourier transform is, is dominant in most fields. There are some fields that if you choose to, you guys are undergraduates, so you have you know, the full road ahead of you to specialize. If you go into a field with a lot of differential equations, that's really when you use a Laplace transform, and that's when you need to know it. So in the EE 102, we cover at UCLA, and, and pretty much all schools, at least that I've seen, we cover the basics of Laplace transforms. Okay, Laplace transforms have a lot of rich history to them, so I don't want to minimize that. But we cover the absolute basics. And now my pointer has stopped working, so give me a quick second. Okay, so EE102 is basics. of Laplace transform. In lecture 17, um, lecture 17, which is not on the final exam, I'll go over some advanced topics just for those who are curious or want to get more of a flavor in Laplace transforms. I'll just also give my personal bias here. Personally, I don't find Laplace transforms that useful in the industries that I operate within. Uh, it almost never comes up. By contrast, Fourier transforms come up all the time, almost on a daily basis. All right. But still, it's important to learn Laplace transforms, at least at an intuitive level. And that's what we'll really try to convey. So please really try to hammer the intuition. We're going to go through a lot of algebra in this lecture, but uh, try not to get lost in the algebra or, again, come to my office hours. So the Fourier transform is very powerful, very, very powerful but it doesn't exist for every signal in systems. So as you've seen, uh, you know, as is put on the slide, uh, basically in a ton of applications, including image processing, communication, circuit design, Fourier transform is great. And we've covered pretty much most of the uh, applications that you, many of you will deal with. There are, however, some systems that are either unstable or are power signals. And in this case, remember that we don't have a Fourier transform for power signals because the energy is not bounded. Uh, and that was, our, that was basically our condition for a signal to have a Fourier transform. So uh, again, in, in most man-made fields like music, image processing, communications, uh, the signal eventually goes to zero, right? If you're listening to a music song, eventually the music is going to stop. If you're looking at an image, eventually the image is going to turn black. Right, because it has a border. It has a finite number of pixels. So these finite time, finite space signals that we deal with in man-made systems, 
have nice Fourier transform expressions. However, uh, the stock market that's continuously evolving or, you know, and ideally continuously growing until it's unbounded. Ideally, we, we assume that the stock market, the S&P 500 is going to increase. Uh, you know, if I go to time infinity, the stock market should be at infinity. And this type of signal is not an energy signal, and therefore it doesn't have a Fourier transform. So then one might ask, how do we analyze these systems in a similar framework to what Fourier analysis enables us to do? So enter the Laplace transform. Let us start with the motivation. So we're going to motivate this with intuition. Let me su let's suppose that we have this nice friendly signal. Okay, this is a friendly signal. Uh, this particular signal, we're going to say that when A is zero, greater than zero, so A is positive, uh, what does the signal look like? Well, e to the positive at is a multiplied by u of t, well, it's going to be a step function, so we know it's going to be causal, so it's going to be zero here. And then afterwards, um, in this particular case, uh, I might have a signal that looks something like this. All right, remember here it's one when t is zero. So I have this nice exponential that's rising, and at time t goes to infinity, this signal, f of t, is not equal to zero. All right, so this is a really simple signal. And unfortunately, we can't actually take a Fourier transform of this signal straight away. So what do we do? Well, one thing we can do is, again, when a is positive, this doesn't have a Fourier transform. So one option is to define a new function uh, of which I can take a Fourier transform. So in particular, I'm going to define, so I have this f of t, which again is our, is our exponential, and it's rising. And let's think, what is the condition that we need to put on this uh, such that, what is the condition we need to put on this exponential such that it eventually goes to zero? Well, somehow we need to turn this exponential Instead of a positive exponential, we need to actually make this some sort of uh, either flat or actually slightly less than flat, some sort of decaying function. Okay, so we need to make it some sort of decaying function. So let's think about what it takes to get it to flat land. If you want to get to flat land, this just needs to be zero for all t, right? It just needs to be one for all t. And that can be done by essentially if I have g of t, I'm taking g of t equals f of t times e to the minus sigma t. Remember that f of t was e to the at times the step function, but we'll just write it as e to the at. So if f of t was e to the at, then if I want to get this somehow to equal 1 everywhere, I need to multiply this by e to the minus at, right? And this is going to equal 1 for all t. This is still not an energy signal because it's not bounded, but it's getting very close. And in particular, in this particular case, sigma equals a. So now I've gotten here to kind of flatline. I've taken this signal that was rapidly increasing without bound to another signal that is not, still not bounded, but it's, it's, it's at least flat. So now instead of being flat, we're going to try to do one better. We're going to try to get one better so that the signal, instead of flat land, it's slightly decreasing. Okay? It's just slightly decreasing enough such that if I go out to time t equals infinity, then the signal eventually decays to zero. So instead of setting sigma equal to a, which would just give me the flat signal, I'm going to set sigma slightly greater than a. And that's going to make g of t a decreasing exponential which means that eventually it'll, uh, at, at time t equals infinity, it'll eventually hit zero. And this signal will have a Fourier transform. All right, so that is the intuition behind the Laplace transform. I have this signal, which is increasing without bound. And I'm effectively going to just convert that signal by multiplying by a decaying exponential to turn an increasing signal into a decreasing signal, which now has the capability of being able to take a Fourier transform.
Okay, so continuing on this thread, I have this g of t, which is a modified version of f of t. It's f of t, which was increasing, which is now multiplied by a decaying exponential. I need to set sigma carefully. There needs to be some care in how I set sigma, but if sigma is sufficiently large, then g of t is gonna to decrease to zero. So the Fourier transform of g of t is telling me how to sum the spectral components e to the j omega t, right? So this is just your uh, equation for the uh, inverse Fourier transform. So g of t might have this capital G and the capital G can be inverted to get me its lowercase g. Oops. Now, continuing on that thread, remember that g of t equals f of t e to the minus sigma t. So now I have this g of t, right? It has a Fourier transform, it has an inverse Fourier transform, so now let's look at how the inverse Fourier transform and the Fourier transform is related to this addition of sigma. So let's start here. Intuitively, remember that f of t equals g of t. So remember, if g of t equals, equals this shown here, then I can also say that f of t is g of t times an increasing exponential. Okay. So in that particular case, Remember from the uh, properties of the Fourier transform, if you want to take the Fourier transform, then I am effectively modul I'm eff effectively shifting the signal with a complex exponential in time. I'm multiplying by complex exponential in time, which as we know in the frequency domain, what that's going to do is it's going to add spectral components. And remember the lecture on modulation. So now instead of, uh, looking at my signal at a frequency of j omega, I'm no longer looking at a frequency of j omega, I'm looking at a frequency of sigma plus j omega. So the intuition that we now have is the following, right? We first said that let's create a surrogate function g of t, which, which represents a decreasing exponential multiplied by f of t. Exponential times f of t. Now we've moved on to saying that, okay, if that's g of t, then f of t, I can re-represent f of t instead of being an unbounded function, I can re-represent f of t as being essentially an increasing exponential. It's gonna actually equal g of t times an increasing exponential. All right. So now if, if we look at this in the Fourier domain and you can review your Fourier transform properties, what that's effectively doing is if I look at the spectral components of f of t, it's now whatever g of t is, right? modulated by this increasing exponential, which means that effectively I end up with this kind of intuitive representation for the new, new spectrum of f of t. It's j omega here as before, but shifted now by positive sigma. So that's the intuition behind the Laplace transform. It's the spectrum of f of t in terms of this new complex exponential that's no longer e to the j omega t, but it's e to the sigma plus j omega parentheses times t. All right, and so what this is, is it's actually a generalization of the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is a specific case of the Laplace transform where sigma equals zero. The Laplace transform is more general. So here's an example. So here I have uh, a couple signals. I have some g of t, which is nicely represented by these, by these complex exponentials. All right, let's pretend that g of t is the signal that has been converted to a decreasing exponential. It's got these nice, clean, 
for your sine, sine and cosine waves, right? And let's just pretend for the sake of argument, I'm only going to draw one particular omega. That's shown here. So we should all be familiar with this. This is one particular omega. Now, if I want to look at this signal in terms of the original f of t and its Laplace transform, here's, I go to the right-hand side of my plot here, and I say, well, what can I learn from this? Well, I, can, I know that this, these, this omega will carry over, right? It still has the omega corresponding to the Fourier transform of g of t, but that's not enough, right? Because what's happening is the signal is increasing without bound over time. So instead of projecting f of t onto sines and cosines, I need to project f of t onto sines and cosines that are increasing over time. Right. And that's what this generalization here does. This sigma here, what it does is it allows you to change the amplitude of the sinusoids that you're projecting on, right? The sinusoids that comprise your signal, that's the omegas, right? It allows me to go and scale them by a factor of e to the power of sigma, e to the power of sigma t. So what that means is that as time grows, the amplitude of the sines and cosines grow so that they start to match this increasing amplitude of f of t. And that's the intuition behind the Laplace transform. Laplace transform is telling you, hey, you know, I have this signal that's unbounded, uh, or I have also bounded signals, right? The Laplace transform is very general. It applies to both. So, hey, I have this signal. It's not just made up of sines and cosines. It's made up of sines and cosines that can start to decrease or increase over time. All right. So one topic that comes up in Laplace transforms is regions of convergence. So let's take a look. Before I do that, I want to define a variable here, a notation. This is a very important notation. It's called S. The Fourier transform is in units of j omega, right? Omega was what our plots were on. The Laplace transform is in units of s. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is, let's say that, uh, you know, I have some, I'm projecting on e to the sigma plus j omega t. That was the basis function. Uh, that was effectively the uh, basis function means kind of the ingredient, right? That's my signal is made up of sines and cosines, but now my signal is made up of whatever this thing is, which is, um, which is sines and cosines that can change their amplitude over time. So uh, here, what I can do is I can just by convention write this as one variable s, right? This is s. And so this actually equals e to the st, where s equals sigma plus j omega. All right, so we typically, when talking about Laplace transforms, as we'll see later in the lecture, we define the indep independent variable to be s as in SAM. Okay, so one interesting question is for what values of sigma does this does this whole exercise work, right? Uh, remember that I might have some f of t which equals e to the at times a step function. So that was kind of clear. Um, so let's look at that more, right? If f of t equals e to the positive at, then what this means right here is that this is your causal exponential that just keeps increasing. So I need to go and I need to bend that exponential back down which I'm going to do by multiplying by uh, e to the minus a, uh, sigma t, where sigma is greater than a. So in general, uh, there exists some sigma naught, right? There exists some sigma naught, shown right here, for which any f of t times this decaying exponential goes to zero. So if I have any signal that is increasing, I can multiply it by a sufficiently steep decreasing exponential to bring it back down to zero. The portion of the complex plane 
where sigma is greater than sigma zero is called the region of convergence. So let's look at this with a concrete example. Suppose that a equals five. So I might have f of t equals e to the five t times the step function u of t. Now, if I want to multiply this by e to the sigma, right? So I want to bring it back down. So f of t times e to the minus sigma t. The goal is to find a sigma naught that is going to bend me back down uh, so that the signal becomes an energy signal. So in this particular case, if I choose sigma equals, I don't know, 5.1, this is going to equal e to the minus 0.1t u of t, which is a decreasing exponential. So in this case, the portion of the complex plane where sigma is greater than sigma zero, sigma zero in this case is five. That's the critical value. And as long as I'm greater than five, uh, that's the region of convergence. So let me explain more with a diagram. The reason it's a complex plane is, remember, we have our notation of f. So imagine I have e to the sigma plus j omega t. We said that this is equivalent to e to the st, where s equals sigma plus j omega. So if s equals sigma plus j omega, what is s? Well, s is nothing but a complex number. So x is nothing but a complex number. So we have a real part of s, which equals sigma. So this horizontal axis tells you all the sigmas. And the imaginary part of s equals omega. And so in this particular case, uh, you may have sigma naught being some value. In the previous example, we, we discussed that, uh, what was it? Uh, sigma naught had to be greater than 5, right? So in the previous case, just in the previous example, this might be 5. So any combination of s, which is sigma plus j omega, such that sigma is the real part is greater than five would give me convergence, meaning that the signal f of t would bend back down to hitting zero. All right, and that gives me this whole region here called the region of convergence. All right. Now, the notation for the Laplace transform is very similar to the prior notation for Fourier transforms because it's also an operator. So remember that we have s being the independent variable, and s equals sigma plus j omega. Now, the Laplace transform is written with this script L. Right? And you'll have some function, as before, some function of time inside. And this function of time gets transformed to a capital function, just like the Fourier transform. But instead of being j omega, it's going to be Fourier transform of s. And that's going to be our standard notation for the Laplace transform. Similarly, as you'll see later in this lecture, you have an inverse Laplace transform where you have uh, the script L to the power of minus 1. So we will also use these bidirectional arrows because we have uh, this, uh, we can take a Laplace transform to, to get from time to the Laplace domain. We can take a inverse Laplace transform to get from the, the um, Laplace domain to the time domain. Now, if you want to compare this with Fourier, just for a moment, this is Laplace. And let's write Fourier here in orange. So Fourier is, you have a function of time, as you remember, and then you have a function of j omega. So in this particular case, with Fourier, 
we assume our signal is made up of complex exponentials. That means sines and cosines, right? Where the sinusoids are imaginary. In the Laplace, our signal is once again made up of sines and cosines. Same thing, but I'm gonna just scale them by e to the sigma t. I'm gonna scale their amplitude, which equals e to the st. Right. So I'm made up of sines and cosines that can increase over time with amplitude should I choose. All right. Very briefly, I'm going to go over the bilateral Laplace transform. This is a advanced topic, not on exam, and at UCLA, this is not in 102. This is not in covered in W102, but I'd like to just introduce you to it real briefly. So Laplace transform incorporates a real exponential. With this S as being sigma plus J omega, J omega is related to the oscillation and sigma is related to decay or growth, as we mentioned. The bilateral Laplace transform is written as follows. It's written as an integral of F of T Remember, f of t is projected onto these, this s domain. So you end up with an integral transform of f of t times e to the minus s t dt. All right. Hopefully this makes sense. And the bilateral nature comes from the fact that you're looking at both sides, minus infinity to infinity. It turns out that the algebra gets really complicated when you have this bilateral sort of transform. So I'll just rewrite it one more time. Just by expanding out, instead of using S, I'll just write it as minus sigma plus j omega t dt. Now the algebra gets really complicated when you have a two-sided signal. So bilateral Fourier transforms are typically talked about in advanced classes. So we will never, in this class, We will never use this definition in the class. But what I want you to convey, um, what I want to sort of convey here is a couple things. The first thing is this is the analogy to the Fourier transform. This is the closest representation to the Fourier transform that the Laplace can take is the bilateral. Uh, it just so happens that unlike the Fourier transform, the math becomes very hairy. So in upper division or graduate courses, you go through the bilateral filter, uh, Laplace transform. Um, if we, oh, I just want to highlight one more thing is the inversion of the bilateral Fourier transform, which is here. If you want to invert the bilateral Fourier transform, it's just like taking an inverse Fourier transform, right? We we flip the exponent exponent sign. We've added some normalization factor here, but we've done one unique thing from the Fourier transform, which is that we've changed the limits. And instead of integrating over all s, we're only integrating over a subset of s from c minus j omega to c plus j omega. And what this effectively is saying is we're going to integrate over the region of convergence to a degree, right? Uh, c here is greater than that critical sigma naught. So you're effectively, you don't need to integrate, you don't want to integrate the signal uh, outside the region of convergence. One last time, we won't use the bilateral Laplace transform in this class. Online definitions, if you use it during the exam and so on, may use the bilateral Laplace transform. So please uh, don't get confused on the homework or the exam. Feel free to post on Piazza, email me, or uh, come to office hours if you're confused. So this is kind of the danger with the online resources. What we are interested in is the unilateral Laplace transform. The unilateral Laplace transform really simplifies things for causal signals. So remember that a causal signal can be written as f of t times u of t. And so the Laplace transform of a causal signal is, again, you're, here we start with the bilateral. This is the bilateral. But since it's causal, we can make it a unilateral 
right? And unilateral effectively means that we're integrating from zero to infinity rather than minus infinity to infinity. Why is this useful? Well, because what we have done is we have changed uh, the lower limit to zero. A zero is something that gives us a clean integral. The upper limit is still infinity. So, so high level, when you deal with improper integrals, which means that the limits are infinity, these are not good. These very often don't give you clean integrals unless you pick really toy signals. So it's not good to have infinity in the limits of an integral if you're trying to do explicit calculation. So what, you, what we say with the unilateral is that we're only going to integrate from zero to infinity. So what that does is it only makes one of the limits improper, which is the top one. But remember that the signal goes to zero at infinity. So the top one effectively becomes easy to integrate because the signal is an energy signal. And that's again, so all this kind of blends together why we have this decaying signal. Okay. So every time in this class that we use Laplace of f of t, it denotes the unilateral Laplace transform of f of t. The Fourier transform, as some of you may see, is a special case of Laplace transform. Remember, s equals sigma plus j omega. So sigma just is zero. So s equals j omega. So that's how the Laplace and Fourier are related. We can go one layer deeper into this. Let's say that uh, we have these plots of the Fourier and Laplace. Right? We're going to plot the complex plane of the independent variable, which is complex now. Um, here you have the imaginary part of s. Here you have the real part of s. And in this particular case, the Fourier transform, I'm going to write the Fourier transform as before in orange. Right? The Fourier transform is everything here. You're sampling this part of S. The Laplace transform is evaluated at a particular S, sigma plus j omega. Uh, it intersects here. Laplace is here. Laplace is in red. So Laplace intersects here. You have sigma here. And you're sampling a line at uh, horizontal coordinate sigma. So in this particular case, the Fourier transform, the independent variable, is strictly imaginary. Laplace transform is complex. All right. So we can go one layer deeper into this. Remember that um, if we want to look at the relationship between Fourier transform and Laplace, one question that may come up is, hey, uh, the variable s equals sigma plus j omega is super similar to j omega, right? It's got this constant addition of sigma, but other than that, it's the same. So, and the representation for the unilateral Laplace transform uh, for a causal signal should be very similar to a Fourier transform of a causal signal. So you may ask, uh, hey, does the Laplace transform just reduce down to the same transform as the Fourier transform, but just instead of j omega, just replace it with s. And that's a perfectly reasonable question. So let's look at an example. So let's say that uh, f of t, in this particular case, is your nice causal decaying exponential. So this is well-behaved. I, I picked the signal because it's well-behaved. So this is cool because it is a signal that looks something like this. So it has a Fourier transform because it's an energy signal. But remember, a Laplace transform, not only does it work for power signals, right, that are unbounded in time, but it also works for energy signals. So the Laplace transform will work for anything, uh, pretty much. So this particular case, I have a signal, f of t. And f of t, remember, it has a Fourier transform f of j omega equals 1 over a plus j omega. Okay, so this was just in the catalog of Fourier transforms. So now, given this, let's see if we can calculate the Laplace transform. So Laplace transform is 
f of s, and that equals, remember this is unilateral, so it's the integral from zero to infinity of the signal f of t. I've removed the causal exp the step function because the step function is just one for, uh, over these limits. So e to the minus a t times e to the minus s t. So this is your Laplace transform equation. So now all we need to do is just plug and chug. So let's plug and chug. So what we can do is we can put a and s in the same exponent, and then we can simply integrate that to obtain this. And now what we have to do is we have to evaluate this from zero to infinity, zero to infinity, all right? So if we're evaluating at zero to infinity, it turns out if you plug this in, let's actually do it explicitly so you can see, let's evaluate this, this, is gonna equal minus one over a plus s e to the minus a plus s times infinity plus one over a times s, okay? So in this particular case, e to the minus infinity is just simply zero. So this guy here, which is zero. So you end up with one over a plus s. And just to be clear, this is a plus, not a times. All right. So now if we look at it, the Fourier, let's go back to our original question. Is the Fourier transform, which is shown right here, here's the Fourier transform. Is the Fourier transform the same as the Laplace transform, but instead of using j omega, just replace that with s. Well, in this particular example, the answer is yes, it's the same thing, all right? And so you'll very often see that the Fourier and Laplace transform are the same, but you just swap j omega and s. All right. So, in general, uh, if I want to understand when the, so in, in this particular case, right, uh, we always want the integrand here, this integrand, which, which is here, to go to zero uh, at the top limit of the improper integral, which is infinity. So let's see when this happens. So if e to the minus a plus s t goes to zero, then obviously the absolute value also goes to zero. So what we can do is we can actually look at the conditions for which the Laplace transform exists. Okay. So for the Laplace transform to exist, I need to be able to take a clean integral. So I need a clean integral here. Again, the top limit is infinity. So if I want a clean integral, I cannot have infinity be in my integral. And for that to happen, When I plug in infinity for the integral, right, or the antiderivative, that needs to go to zero. So let's see what condition there is for this to happen. So if e to the minus a plus s t goes to zero, then so does the absolute value. Uh, here, what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna plug in s. So first line, let's plug in s. Now let's simplify this. This can be simplified to e to the minus a plus sigma t times e to the minus j omega t. Since this is an absolute value, we can split the absolute value for multiplication. All right. Now remember that the magnitude of the complex exponential is simply one, right? This guy here equals one. Therefore I have e to the minus a plus sigma t. All right. So in this particular case, uh, I'm allowed to remove the absolute value because this guy is positive. 
we know that um, this is strictly positive or, or zero. Um, so now if we want to analyze this further, what we can say is that e to the minus a plus st goes to zero when e to the minus a plus sigma t goes to zero. So this exercise here that was just shown, right, all this exercise here was just shown to remove out the omega, right? I split out the omega so I can relate this only to the sigma term. So now what it's telling you is that e to the minus a plus sigma t goes to zero. Well, when does that happen, right? If T approaches infinity. When does that happen? Well, in this particular case, this happens if sigma is greater than minus a. And this is a sigma. If sigma is greater than minus a, then Laplace transform exists. And once again, this is the region of convergence. So if sigma is greater than minus a, that's also like saying that the real part of S has to be greater than minus a. And so this is one of your criteria for the convergence of the Laplace transform the real part of S has to be greater than minus A. So let's take a look. Here I have the Laplace transform of the causal exponential equals one over A plus S. And we know that if A is positive, then effectively this has the same representation as the Fourier transform, right? In this particular case. And this holds, when over a region of convergence, where if I have an A that's positive, I also need to make sure that I'm evaluating the independent variable of the Laplace transform at real values that are greater than minus A. So in this region of convergence, where I'm evaluating S at a value greater than minus A, the Laplace transform is the exact same thing as the Fourier transform, with j omega replaced with s. So one key thing to note is that this Laplace transform holds for any type of A. It doesn't need to be, in general, even though if I don't have a Fourier transform, I can still have a Laplace transform. So what I'm saying here is that Laplace transform of a causal exponential also works with a unbounded exponential that's, that's continuously increasing. It may not have a Fourier transform, but it will have a Laplace transform. So this will hold as long as sigma is greater than negative a. So what that means is that for some positive a, if I take a Laplace transform, I'm effectively going to get 1 over s minus a, right? So instead of taking the Laplace transform of e to the minus at, I'm going to take a Laplace transform of e to the at. So I'm going to take a Laplace transform of a increasing exponential that is shown here in this, this sort of script, right? That is shown here. And this was the earlier example. So, uh, what that means is, let's take a look at the S-plane real quick. This is my S-plane, and I have the real part of S, have the imaginary part of S on the y-axis. So let's take a look at a couple of causal exponentials. Uh, one causal exponential would be if I have A equals to 2. Right? If I have A equals 2, now sigma has to be greater 
then minus two. So in this particular case, here's minus two. And so the region of convergence for this exponential is here. Another example would be a equals minus one. This means that sigma needs to be greater than one. Okay, cool. So in this particular case, if a equals minus one, then all of a sudden this becomes a positive uh, exponential, which means that it's just gonna keep increasing without bound. The region of convergence is at sigma greater than one. So I'm gonna plot that, here's one. And you'll see that it does not include the Fourier transform. Fourier transform is at the origin, right? The Fourier transform is in orange here at the origin. So the Fourier transform here is not in the region of convergence, which makes perfect sense because if a equals minus one, then e to the minus at is positive. So in general, the Fourier transform of e to the t, u of t, doesn't exist. It's not equal to one over j omega minus a, right? Because the Fourier transform doesn't exist. And we proved that in a previous lecture. Okay, so, um, if you like, we can try a check your understanding question. Uh, as a check your understanding question, please go ahead and take the Laplace transform of the step function. So suppose that f of t equals u of t. And remember that the Laplace transform is capital F of s equals the integral from zero to infinity of u of t e to the minus st dt, right? So go ahead and you can just work through this equation and compute the Laplace transform with plug and chug. So feel free to pause the video and then rejoin us. And one more thing is also compute the region of convergence, right? So feel free to pause and rejoin us. Okay, welcome back. So all we have to do here is just plug and chug. So let me write my answer in magenta. What we're gonna have to do is we're gonna start from this integral. Remember the step function is just one. So this is just e to the minus st dt. Uh, the integral of e to the minus st equals minus one over s e to the minus st from zero to infinity. In this particular case, uh, if I just plug in the limits here, that equals one over s. All right, and so that's essentially my answer. It's one over s. Just by comparison, the Fourier transform of the step function, you may remember, as being one over j omega plus pi delta of omega. So in this particular case, remember that we don't have the same uh, Laplace transform as we do for the Fourier transform. Now, the second part to the question was, please find the region of convergence. So what's the region of convergence? Well, region of convergence is, quite simple here. What we need is we need this guy here to be a decreasing exponential, right? We need it to hit zero when time t equals infinity. Otherwise, that improper integral is not going to converge. And so as long as e to the minus st goes to zero, as t or infinity goes to zero, infinity, then you're in the region of convergence. So this will occur as long as S, the real part of S, is greater than zero. 
Okay. Uh, if you want to plot that as well, just to, to finish it off, you might have a plot. And in this particular case, the region of convergence is everything here. And one thing you'll kind of note is, and one reason that the Laplace transform, the Fourier transform of a step function is a very funny Fourier transform. And that one is actually not in the region of convergence here. So the Fourier transform of a step function, um, we don't calculate the explicit Fourier transform. This term right here, this was asked on Piazza, it's actually very complicated where it comes from. What it's trying to do is it's effectively trying to correct for the fact that omega cannot be zero, otherwise this is gonna blow up, right? One over J omega is gonna blow up to you know, something really, really high. Uh, and that's what the delta function is for because that will, when omega is zero, that's there. That's almost artificially added. Um, it's, uh, it's a really advanced topic, but if you wanna get into it, uh, when you compute the step function Fourier transform, so this is, you know, very advanced. Uh, computing the Fourier transform of a step function is hard. And the reason is you end up with something like this. You eventually end up with an integral Let's use time just to be consistent. You end up with some integral like this, minus one to one. And how do you integrate this, right? Because if you think about integral as adding up values of time, well, when time t equals zero, this is gonna be infinity, right? So no matter what, I've got an improper term in my integral. That's the whole thing you wanna avoid with integrals. You don't wanna be adding up infinity because infinity plus a number is not defined. Uh, right there, you've lost the game. So in this particular case, uh, when t is zero, which is within the bounds of the integral, I'm gonna get infinity, I'm gonna be adding it up, you know, I've lost the game. It turns out that there's a very special type of way to integrate these functions. Uh, you may have seen in high school that uh, you can integrate this from minus one the zero on the negative side of one over t, dt, and then add that to integral of zero on the positive side to one of one over t, dt. It turns out that even splitting the integral this way doesn't work uh, because you're not counting for zero. So you actually do something called a Cauchy principal value. look up Cauchy integral, which is a different type of integral that's designed for integrating uh, very nasty terms like this that are not actually defined. So that's uh, quite outside the scope of this class, but just in case you were curious about where this Fourier transform came from and why this Fourier transform is not in the region of convergence of the Laplace, it's because it's not really a Fourier transform. It's kind of a funny Fourier transform that is now in our catalog, but actually comes about with very advanced mathematics that go into the definition of integrals, integral theory. Okay, so that just explains why even though S has to be strictly positive, that we actually do have a Fourier transform defined here, even though it's not in the region of convergence. All right, so, the Fourier transform of the step is here. There's this additional pi delta omega term. Again, it comes from not taking a classical integral that we learned in high school using fundamental theorem of calculus. It comes about using new definitions of integrals that the mathematician Cauchy introduced later after Newton and Leibniz. Okay, so Consider the Laplace transform of f of t equals cosine of omega t, right? Let's say you want to take the Laplace transform of a cosine. Well, there are a lot of ways to take the Laplace transform of a cosine. One way to do it is simply to split the cosine into uh, its, uh, use the trigonometric formula to just write it this way. And now it's just going to be one half times 
the Laplace of this exponential plus the Laplace of this exponential. Because remember, the Laplace transform is linear. It has that linearity property, just like the Fourier transform. And so if you actually compute this, f of s is going to simplify down to s over s squared plus omega squared. So now the region of convergence is going to be equal to the real part of s in this particular case. In order to get my Laplace transforms to nicely have no infinities after I evaluate the integral, this needs to be, again, greater than 0. So feel free to try and compute this particular um, Laplace transform. And once again, region of convergence strictly positive. And if we remember our Fourier transform of cosine omega t, we also know that it's not really a function. Uh, it's actually a Dirac delta, which is not actually a, a well-defined function because we don't know how high the spike actually is. So. Um, uh, in this particular case, it also makes sense that the region of convergence is uh, strictly positive. All right, uh, we could also have Laplace transform of powers of t. So for example, I might have a function f of t equals t to the n. And just to make life simple, let's also strictly multiply it by step function just to show that this is causal. So t to the n, uh, I have this function for some uh, n greater than or equal to 1. And the question then is, what is the Laplace transform? Well, the Laplace transform is written right here, right? It's t to the n times e to the st dt, e to the actually e to the minus st dt. So uh, one way to integrate this, uh, so we can just do plug and chug on this integral, and you will get an answer. Um, something like n over s Laplace of t to the n minus 1. Right. Uh, what I'm actually going to do is I'm not going to just write plug and chug. I'm actually going to go through and integrate this for you because it's actually a nasty integral. So we can just practice together uh, this particular integral. So this integral is not a clean integral. You may re recognize this as an integration by parts problem. Integration by parts, integral of u dv equals u v minus v d. Integral of v du. Okay. So here, let's look at what our friends are. So here, u is t to the n. dv equals e to the minus st dt du equals, this should be the power rule, right? So it's nt to the n minus 1 dt. And v equals the integral, right? So it's going to be minus 1 over s e to the minus st. So in this particular case, if I plug this in, I can say that the Laplace transform of t to the n, which is our goal on the slide, where we're trying to compute the Laplace transform of t to the n, that's our goal. So the Laplace transform of t to the n is going to be capital F of s equivalently, which is going to equal, in this particular case, it's going to equal this integral right here. This integral right here is integrated by parts, so that's minus t to the n, e to the minus s t, divided by s, evaluated from 0 to infinity, plus integral of 0 to infinity, 1 over s, e to the minus s t, n t, to n minus 1, dt. And this guy, well, again, we have e to the minus st. So let's, as long as 
that's kind of telling us our convergence, right? E to the minus st approaches zero, t approaches infinity, then this guy is going to be zero minus zero, right? That's what the first term will evaluate to, plus n over s will go out of the integral, integral zero to infinity, t to the n minus one, e to the minus st dt, All right? So now let's take a look. This thing in magenta, what is this? Well, this is nothing but the unilateral Laplace transform of t to the n minus one. So therefore, this is gonna equal n over s times Laplace transform of t to the n minus one, All right? So the Laplace transform of powers has this unique property that is different from the Fourier transform. This is unique to the Laplace transform, where the Laplace transform of t to the n is n over s times the Laplace transform of t to the n minus one. So let's just continue on this thread. I'm gonna make a new page here. So just continuing on this thread, we just learned that Laplace transform of t to the n is equal to n over s times the Laplace transform of t to the n minus one. So in this particular case, let's suppose n Suppose that I ask you to compute uh, the Laplace transform of t to the one, right? Laplace transform of t. Now, we know that t to the zero equals one and zero otherwise, which actually equals step function. So what this is saying is that, remember that the step function has a well-defined Laplace transform. The step function has a Laplace transform of one over s. Okay, we derived that earlier on the slide, uh, check your understanding question. So therefore, Laplace transform of t to the one equals one over s. So here we've supposed that n equals one and we've been able to calculate Laplace transform for n equals one. In general, in the more general setting, Laplace transform of t to the zero, we know. Okay, so what is the Laplace transform of t to the zero? Well, t to the zero is a step function. So it's the Laplace transform of the step function, which equals one over s. Laplace transform of t to the one in this particular case, what is the Laplace transform of t to the one? It's one over s times one over s. So I made a little mistake here in the magenta. Uh, remember that we have uh, this rule right here. Laplace transform of t to the n equals n over s times Laplace transform of t to the n minus one. So if the step function was one over s, I need to go and then multiply that by n over s. And remember n was one because it was t to the one. And this should have equaled one over s squared. Okay. So Laplace transform of t to the two. Well, you can apply a similar analogy like we just did. Uh, you go and go up here again and just apply the power rule. So this effectively becomes two over s cubed. And you can do this you know, for many more powers and you can go up to t to the n. And this has a general expression of n factorial 
over s to the n plus 1. So as practice, I encourage you, if possible, to check your understanding and see if you can derive the general term. All right. So uh, we went through a few example Laplace transforms. So here's one. Let's suppose that f of t equals a Dirac. Uh, so we did the step function. So now uh, another friend to try, a friendly function, is the Dirac function. So how would we compute the Laplace transform? Well, we know the Laplace transform expression. If you want to check your understanding, you can pause the video. But this is a simple one, so we can just go straight through it. The Laplace transform is f of s equals integral 0 to infinity of the delta function of t e to the minus st dt. Okay. Uh, this equals integral of 0 to infinity delta of t e to the 0 dt because of the sifting property of delta. And this e to the 0 equals 1, so it's integral of delta. So this equals just 1. Therefore, the Laplace transform of a delta function equals 1. Very similar, again, to the Fourier transform in this particular case. But what's interesting about Laplace transform is the geometric patterns that arise. So here's a geometric pattern. Uh, it's kind of like a geometric series. That's why I say it's a geometric pattern. Uh, the trend is. Remember that the delta function is the derivative of the step function. Okay. So the delta function is related to the step function by division by s. Uh, then we have here, again, another effectively integration. So every time we integrate, we're multiplying the Laplace transform, some more integrations we're multiplying Laplace transform by 1 over s. So differentiating the signal uh, multiplies by s. Integrating multiplies the signal by 1 over s. So now what we can do is we can look at differential equations. So let's say I have a differential equation, like you know I have some signal x of t, but this is the third derivative right, of x plus 5x prime of t plus x of t equals 0. So in this particular case, x of t is, has a Laplace representation of capital X of s, right? That's the Laplace transform of lowercase x. So now we can just apply what we've learned about the um, uh, derivative property right, that we just learned on the previous slide, to say that this equation right here can be modified, right, in the Laplace transform domain. The third derivative of x is s cubed times x of s, capital X of s, Laplace transform, plus, in this case, the 5 is a constant. 5s capital X of s plus X of s equals 0. And this particular example, I'm going to cross my x's as is often done just to denote that it's capital. It's very hard to sometimes tell lowercase x and capital X. And this equals 0. So now what it's done is it's taken a differential equation and converted it to an algebraic equation. So Laplace takes a diff EQ and converts it to algebraic. And we know it's much easier to solve algebraic equations than differential equations. So the Laplace is like um, Laplace transform and differential equation is like peanut butter and jelly, right? These, this is why we use the Laplace transform. So Laplace transform has very similar properties to Fourier. You can review it. Some are subtly different, but the key ones are still there, right? Like linearity or convolution property. Uh, the convolution property is very important because the LTI system still applies. So you have an LTI system, 
right, x goes into h to give you y, we know that y equals x convolved with h. It also turns out that the, in this particular case, that in the Laplace domain, the Laplace transform of capital, uh, of, of lowercase y, which is capital Y, times Laplace transform of H. So Laplace transform of Y is going to equal capital X times H. Okay. So you have that same property of LTI systems. You have the convolution uh, theorem that applies. And that's one of the questions on your homework. It's related to that. So once again, the key reason to use Laplace transforms is that uh, not just for the example of the step function that we went earlier, but it turns differential equations into algebraic equations. So you have this uh, series of, you know, all the way from a second derivative to up to an integral, and you can see how this modifies the Laplace transform. You can see that every time you differentiate the Laplace transform, you're multiplying by s. And when you actually evaluate these, you also have this boundary condition to just keep in mind, right? When you actually evaluate this on, uh, you know, differential equations that have, that have a boundary condition. Okay. So as a check your understanding question, uh, maybe what you can try is see if you can use the uh, properties of the Laplace transform to try and get the um, derivative uh, Laplace transform of the step on the right. So remember that we have the Fourier transform of the step function. Um, so now the question is, how do we find the Laplace transform of the step and the ramp function if we only knew uh, the Laplace transform of the delta? Okay, so once again, in a previous check your understanding question in this lecture, we plug and chugged the Laplace transform of the step function as being one over s. Uh, let's pretend that we cannot go and plug and chug that for whatever reason, uh, but I've told you that the Laplace transform of a delta is just one. Now, since you know that the step function is the integral of a delta, and you know that the ramp function is the integral of the step function, can you use the integral and derivative properties uh, to actually go and get the Laplace transform of these higher uh, uh, integral and derivative relationship functions? All right. So feel free to pause the video and then give it a try. Okay, welcome back. So what we have here is remember that the delta function has a Laplace transform of one, which we was given to us in the question. Now the Laplace transform of the step function, what is that? Well, that is gonna be the Laplace transform of the integral from zero to t of a delta function, d tau, it's the integral. Right, so it's the integral of a, uh, a, a delta function. And the integral of a delta function, right, just given the properties of Laplace, it's gonna be one over s, right? If I'm integrating, I'm dividing by s, times the Laplace transform of the delta function, and Laplace of the delta function is just one, so this equals one over s, which is exactly what we would expect uh, given our previous check your understanding question. So now we can apply that to the ramp function as well. Laplace transform of the ramp function is the Laplace transform of u of t, again, divided by s, and this equals one over s squared. 
So now what we've done is we've used the properties of uh, differentiation and integration of Laplace transforms and how friendly it is. And that tells us if we know the Laplace transform of a function that can be integrated or differentiated into a different form, we also know the Laplace transform of the integral and derivative. Another example that you, 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 know, you may want to look at is um, inverting the Laplace transform. So in general, the inverse of a Laplace transform is given by this following equation. Uh, you have some um, Laplace transform f of s, and you're going to flip the sign of the exponent, and you're going to scale it by 1 over 2 pi j, and then you're going to integrate over the region of convergence. So these are a few Laplace transforms, inverse Laplace transforms and Laplace transforms that may come in handy. These may seem like a very small set, right? Causal exponential, sine, cosine, um, and then something kind of crazy on the bottom, which we'll go through in more detail. But these are the ones that actually show up a lot in differential equations. So this is a catalog, and it may be useful to also know how you compute uh, the catalog itself. And it turns out to compute uh, Laplace transforms, you use what are called partial fractions. So let's assume that the Laplace transform is a rational number. It's a, it's a rational number, so it can be written as the ratio of an A and a B. And further, let's assume that A and a B are, in, are polynomials. So it could be any polynomial. Uh, and in this particular case, I've written the numerator as a polynomial of order M and the denominator as a polynomial of order N. So in this particular case, B of S has M roots and A of S and it's the roots of B of S are called zeros of F of S. So that means that B of S equals zero, then capital F of S equals zero. So these are called zeros. And the roots of A of S, which is in the denominator, are what are called, these are not zeros of S, but these are actually called poles of F of S. So that means that when the denominator is zero, then the function itself, which is the Laplace transform, equals infinity. So in this particular case, if I can write f of s as b of s divided by a of s, then what that allows me to do is it allows me to say that the denominator, which is uh, a of s, that polynomial, uh, can be factored. So let's say that a0 plus a1s all the way up to a n to the Sn is equal to S minus lambda 1, S minus lambda 2, and so on, all the way up to S minus lambda n. Uh, without, you know, going too deep into it for now, let's assume that no poles are repeated. Uh, and also that M is less than N, that there are more poles then there are zeros. If this holds, right, which means that no poles are repeated, once again, I'll just, which is uh, a medium strong assumption. It turns out that for many Laplace transforms that we deal with for differential equations, no poles will be repeated. And in this class, we're gonna make that assumption for the final exam. And um, that's the you know, typical standard for 102 would also be on the homeworks in the final exam. Uh, we're going to assume that no poles are repeated. So we can use this method of computing Laplace transforms. Okay. This holds for all n. So then uh, capital F of s can be written in partial fraction expansion as follows. Okay. F of s 
is going to equal some constant r that I don't know divided by each root. So remember, this is very similar to one of the exercises that we did in a previous lecture, where we can actually, if the denominator is written as a multiplication, as a product, we can actually split a product into a sum where we don't know what the numerator is. So in this particular case, lambda 1 to lambda n are the poles of capital F. These unknown numbers that sit on top of the partial fractions that are summed together are called residues. And just as one property, just as a helpful property, if, uh, if you find it helpful, in fact, it will help on one of the homework questions, it turns out that when lambda k equals lambda l conjugate, so if, uh, if the poles, if there are two poles that are conjugate pairs, uh, then their residuals are conjugate pairs. Okay, so if we can write the Laplace transform f of s as a partial fraction, then taking the inverse Laplace transform is easy because we know the inverse Laplace transform from the catalog of residual over s minus lambda one. Let me be concrete, right? So now here we've taken the Laplace transform and written it as a sum of partial fractions. So we can take the inverse Laplace transform of this. So to take the inverse Laplace transform of this, we can simply write R1 times Laplace inverse of one over S minus lambda one. And this will hold for up to Rn of Laplace inverse of one over S minus lambda n. And so this is going to be equal to R1 E. So we know what the Laplace inverse Laplace transform of this is, right? It's just, uh, uh, this is again, once again, just, just, a, just an exponential. So E to the lambda 1 T plus R2 E to lambda 2 T plus and so on. All right. So now we know that if we have the Laplace transform that's given to us, it's a rational expression with polynomials with some assumptions, then it can be split and broken into partial fractions. And if we can break it into partial fractions, we can find Laplace transform in an elementary manner because we know Laplace transform of an exponential. So now the hard part in order to put this all together is to actually how to find the partial fraction. So to find the partial fraction expansion, uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to somehow find the poles, which basically means we need to factor the, the denominator polynomial, and then we need to find the residual. So these are a two-step process. There are three main methods to find partial fractions. These are kind of painful exercises in algebra. All three are painful. In this lecture, in the homework and in the final exam, we're going to use the least painful method and the most common method, which is called the cover-up method, which is, I think, sufficient to sort of get the concept of, uh, you know, hey guys, Laplace transform inverse is really, really hard to take. Supplemental lecture 17, uh, lecture 17, which is not covered on grading, may discuss some other advanced methods. Okay, but in what follows, I'm going to discuss what you may need for the homework and what you may need for the final exam. R2, R3, all right? So the simplest way to do that is to isolate R1, as I was saying. So to isolate R1, you're actually gonna multiply uh, both sides by S minus lambda one. If I multiply both sides by S minus lambda one, I'm gonna end up isolating R1 here. Right. Now, these guys are gonna just simply cancel. And so I'm going to be left with, Uh, B0 plus B1S plus B2S squared over S minus lambda 2, S minus lambda 3. So now I want to solve for R1. So what I want to do is I want to effectively kind of cover up the other residuals, right? I want to somehow take this away and take this away so I can isolate R1. And in order to do that, what I can do is I can set S equals lambda 1. So I can sample this at S equals lambda 1. So if I do that, these guys go to zero. And so if S equals lambda one, 
then this s gets changed to lambda one, this s gets changed to lambda one. So let me write this neatly. B zero plus B one s plus B two s squared divided by lambda one minus lambda two, lambda one minus lambda three. And so this is going to be equal to R1. So now you have solved for R1 because we know the poles. We're going to assume we know the poles. And remember that the Laplace transform has been given to us, so we know the numerator polynomial. So now that we know the residual, we can simply solve this. So in general, we can solve for the kth residual that way, this way, in the same way. It's not just applied to the first residual. In general, RK equals s minus lambda k s minus lambda k capital F of s evaluated at remember s equals lambda k and that gives me r k. So I just follow the same procedure that I did for R1, and I can do that for any residual. So maybe we should go through a concrete example of using the cover-up. So let's say we have we are given a Laplace transform. So I'm going to give you right here this Laplace transform. And to check your understanding, I want you to find the partial fraction decomposition. Well, you know the partial fraction decomposition is going to be here, right? It's going to be uh, I'm going to just use the product and, and some conversion, right? I have this product of three numbers in the, in the denominator on the left. So I'm going to have the sum of three fractions with the same denominator. I just don't know what the numerator is. And so my goal is somehow to solve for R1, R2, and R3. And that's going to write, let me write this as a partial fraction. So if you want to check your understanding, you can actually apply the algebra from the cover-up method and try to obtain uh, the partial fraction expansion of this particular uh, Laplace transform. So feel free to pause the video and rejoin us. Okay, welcome back. So let me just speed through it. Remember that residual one is computed as follows. What I'm gonna do is let's find the pole for lambda one. Lambda one is nothing but zero, okay? So in this particular case, I'm going to multiply by s minus 0, which is s. So I'm going to be multiplying here by s, all right? So the s is just simply going to cancel here. So what I'm going to be left with is s squared minus 2 divided by s plus 1, s plus 2. And this is going to be evaluated at s equals 0. And so this is going to equal uh, s is 0, so it's going to be minus 2 over 1 times 2 is 2, which equals minus 1. Okay? So therefore, r1 equals minus 1. All right, let's do r2. So r2, we're going to multiply this uh, Laplace transform by s minus lambda 2. Lambda 2 is what? Well, lambda 2 in this particular case is, what is lambda 2? So lambda 2 is minus 1 in this particular case. So I'm going to multiply by S. So I have S squared minus 2 divided by Right, lambda is minus one, so I'm going to multiply by s minus minus one, which is s plus one. So this s plus one is going to cancel. So I'm going to multiply by s plus one. This is going to cancel. Right. So I have s squared minus two divided by s times s plus two, and this is evaluated at s equals uh, minus one. And so this is going to be equal to 1 minus 2 divided by minus 1 times 1. And this equals 
minus one over minus one equals one. R3, I'm gonna follow the same procedure. So I end up with S squared minus two over S, S plus one, evaluated at S equals minus two. And this is equal to four times two divided by minus two times minus one. This is equal to eight divided by two, which equals, um, oops. So four minus two, right? Four minus two equals two divided by, in this particular case, two, which equals one. So now I have R1, R2, R3. So I know that the partial fraction expression here is going to be minus one over S plus one over S plus one plus one over S plus two. So that's my partial fraction answer that I should get. Now I know how to take the Laplace transform of this. And so I can put that together. As another concrete example, let's look at an end to end straight from the homework to make life a little bit more sane. So if we look at the homework, remember that one of the questions, question 4b, asks you to do the following. It gives you a Laplace transform, s plus 4 over s cubed plus 4s, and it asks you to actually compute the inverse Laplace transform. So in order to compute the inverse plus Laplace transform, we first need to compute partial fraction. And then that gets us, uh, once we have partial fractions, we just use the catalog to convert back to the um, time domain function. So in this particular case, we have Laplace transform, uh, s plus four over s cubed plus four s. So in this particular case, the first thing we can do is let's uh, write this in a more convenient form for partial fractions, we can factor out the S, right? So if we factor out the S, we're gonna get S squared plus four, all right? Now, this is gonna equal, I'll just erase here so I get more space. This is gonna equal R1 over S plus R2 over S plus j2 or 2j plus r3 or s minus j2. So if you're going to use the cover-up procedure using cover-up, we need to find r1, r2, r3. So it turns out that r1 equals 1. Uh, we'll quickly go through it just to give you a sense. So r1 equals 1 because R1, you're going to take this polynomial and remember that lambda 1 is 0. So I'm just going to be multiplying by S. If I multiply by S, I have S plus 4 divided by S squared plus 4. And I'm going to be evaluating this at S equals 0. And this is nothing but equal to 1 equals 1. So R1 equals 1, right? shown right here. R2 is going to be equal to, in this particular case, j minus 2 over 4. And note that R2, R3 equals R2 conjugate. So we can also conjugate the uh, residual, right? So that's going to give us minus j minus 2 divided by 4. Therefore, The Laplace transform can be written in terms of partial fractions as 1 over s plus 1 fourth j minus 2 divided by s plus 2j minus 1 fourth j plus 2 divided by s minus 2j. And so here's your Laplace transform in partial fraction. So all you need to do is just go to the catalog and try to understand what the inverse Laplace transform of this is, right? I can tell you that, for example, we just learned that 1 over s is the 
uh, inverse Laplace transform of this is uh, a very simple form. Okay, so feel free to give this a try because remember this is the step function. All right, so feel free to give this a try and uh, you can attempt that on homework 4b and if you're still stuck, feel free to come to office hours. Another question on the homework is differential equations based. So in this particular question, you're asked to find the transfer function of the system and you're given a system that's a differential equation. Now, this is where the Laplace transform actually kind of makes sense. Laplace transform is really good when you have differential equations. And remember that same relation of the convolution theorem holds with the Laplace transform. The same relationship also with the complex exponential holds with the Laplace transform. So let's put these two pieces together. The first thing we can do is simply note that we can take the Laplace transform of this differential equation. So we can take the Laplace transform. So the Laplace transform here of this is if I apply that, let's call this in purple Laplace. So Laplace transform of this is S squared capital Y of S plus 3S capital Y of S plus 2Y of S and that equals A capital S X of S. So I'm just applying the derivative property of the Laplace transform to get this relationship. So in this particular case, we know that we know H1 equals Y of S over X of S from everything we've learned about transfer functions and convolution theorem and so on. So if we simply rearrange so I can just now rearrange this equation into this form if I take y and divide by x. So the question is asking you for h1 of s. This equals y of s over x of s. Okay. This is going to equal in this particular case, y divided by x is going to give you a over s squared plus 3s plus 2. And this equals a divided by s plus 1, s plus 2. Now, you're almost done. You have the transfer function written as a over s plus 1 times s plus two, but the question asks you, you should find the value of a, right? It says the answer should not be in terms of a, so this is not the full answer. So think about what you would do for the next step to find a. As a hint, if I put e of s of t into the system, right, into the system, I should get out the same thing. I should get that, get out e to the st, but there may be some phase term, right? I'm going to get back uh, uh, some scaling by the phase, right, of h, and I'm also going to get back an amplitude scaling h of s. So in this particular case, I have h of s e to the st. So if you use this property, uh, and remember that the question tells you that this has already been put in, you already put in a complex exponential, see if you can finish the question. So once again, good luck with the homework. Thanks for your attention in this lecture, and see you in the next lecture.